few composers have been honoured with quincentenary celebrations. To be sure, the business of composing polyphonic music has been going on in Europe for almost a thousand years. But it is only for the last five centuries or so that the biographical details, and in many cases the names, of the relevant individuals have found their way into the historical record. In this respect, the 14th century French composer Guillaume de Machaut is the most significant early outlier, although in 1877 the quincentenary of his death seems to have gone unnoticed. At that time, Machaut's name was known only to a handful of music antiquarians, none of whom could ever have heard his works properly performed. It took the passage of another century or so, and the achievements of musicological scholarship for composers such as Guillaume Dufay in 1974 and Johannes Ockerham in 1997 to be commemorated on the 500th anniversaries of their deaths. And it will take the passage of further time for many composers to be commemorated on the 500th anniversaries of their births. For, with a notable exception I will mention later, even figures such as Dufay and Ockerkum had been born in obscurity. So, too, was the French composer Josquin Desprez. Apart from records of his membership of the Sistine Chapel Choir, fewer than 50 archival documents and literary references dating from his lifetime contain indubitable references to him. Since modern interest in his music was kindled in the 1920s, much of the relevant biographical research has consisted of disentangling the composer from more than 30 Renaissance musicians who also went under various forms of the name Josquin, plus some 20 other individuals called Desprez. It is now clear that Josquin's family name was in fact Le Bluet, and that his father and grandfather, who appear to have been local police officers, suffixed this with des prés, possibly because they hailed from the village of Pré in the forest of Ardennes. Both were named Gossard, from which was derived the diminutive Gosquin, or Little Goose, an appropriate nickname for the son of Gossard II. Similarly, the name Josquin is a diminutive of Jos, a Christian name widespread around 1500 and borrowed from a 7th century Breton saint. Without the existence of a legal document from 1483 identifying Josquin as the sole heir of his uncle Gilles Le Bluet de Desprez, the composer's genealogy would have remained impossible to determine. The earliest document that can be associated with Josquin, albeit cautiously, dates from 1466 and records a gift of eight shillings and fourpence to a certain Gosquin on completion of his duties as an altar boy at a church in the city of Cambrai. This suggests two crucial biographical details. First, that Josquin was born between 1450 and 1455, and second, that he received his formative musical training as a choir boy at Cambrai Cathedral. Of his continuing training, we know nothing for certain. The great Venetian music theorist Giuseppe Zarlino reported in 1558 that Chosquin had been a pupil of the Flemish composer Ockerkum. Probably this did not imply a teacher-student relationship in the modern sense, but rather that Josquin absorbed Ockerham's technique and style from studying and imitating his compositions. In this, the opening of Ockerham's motet to the Virgin Mary Alma Redemptoris Mater, listen for the distinctive initial rising scale and the use of two contrasting pairs of voices.
Now compare Josquin's setting of the same words. Plagiarism? Not by Renaissance standards. For although the two compositions sound almost identical, Josquin has taken the ingenious step of incorporating a second, simultaneous text in honour of the Virgin, Ave Regina Celorum. Hence, while his motet obviously takes Ockham's as a model, it is just as obviously a clever variation on that model. Probably from his early twenties, Josquin was pursuing a career as a singer in royal and aristocratic household chapel choirs. Positions in such choirs ranked highly within the household and could entail diplomatic and administrative responsibilities, as well as giving access to extracurricular incomes from church lands and properties, known as benefices. In 1474, Josquin was listed among the chapel of the Duke of Anjou in Provence. In 1480, he seems to have entered the service of King Louis XI at Paris, and in 1484, he took up employment with Cardinal Ascanio Sforza in Milan. Josquin's music was already circulating in Italy some years before his arrival there. The Casanatense songbook, copied at the court of Ferrara, attaches his name, in various forms, to six pieces, including this song about the rustic seduction of a maiden from the Basque country, Une Mousque de Biscaye. Josquin's next appointment, in 1489, was to the Papal Choir of the Sistine Chapel, where his compositions were copied into what are now the chapel's oldest surviving music books. Despite remaining a member of the choir for at least five years, he maintained strong ties with northern France. He is even said to have been in the French retinue when King Louis XII invaded Milan in 1499, expelling Josquin's former employer Cardinal Ascanio and the whole Sforza family. Josquin seems to have been quite a favourite of Louis XII, to judge by a story printed some fifty years later by the Swiss music theorist Heinrich Glarien. The king, the story goes, promised the composer a benefice, but forgot to make the necessary financial arrangements. 
Accordingly, Josquin set to music a portion of Psalm 119, beginning not unsubtly with verse 49, Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. A performance of the new motet was greeted with the approval of the whole court, and the king was duly chided for his forgetfulness. In 1503, Josquin returned to Italy to serve in the chapel of Duke Ercole d'Este of Ferrara. Extant documents relating to the appointment include a reference for a rival candidate, the Netherlandish composer Heinrich Isaac, which states that although Josquin was the superior composer, he would write only by inclination and never to order. Besides, the reference goes on, Josquin would command the unprecedented salary of 200 ducats, and Isaac a mere 120. Possibly, though, the duke was already on good terms with Josquin, who may some years previously have completed a celebrated composition that spells out the duke's name in musical code, the Missa Hercules Dux Ferrarie. In any case, Duke Ercole took the advice of another referee, who assured him that there is neither lord nor king who will have a better chapel than yours if your lordship sends for Josquin. During his twelve-month tenure at Ferrara, the unbiddable Josquin appears to have acquiesced to at least one commission from his employer, a setting of the penitential Psalm 51, Miserere Mei. The distinctive dotted rhythm, repeated notes and expressive semitonal inflection would be alluded to in later settings of the same words. Here are two such homages to Josquin, the first by Orlandus Lassus from 1566, the second by William Byrd from 1591.
Josquin's final and longest appointment, from 1504 until his death, was close to his birthplace, at the town of condé sur lescaut on the present-day border between France and Belgium. The Collegiate Church of Notre Dame, where Josquin held the most senior position of provost, comprised some 60 clerics in various orders, as well as six boy choristers, and was clearly capable of maintaining an expert choir. Josquin died on the 27th of August 1521, a fact luckily transcribed from his tombstone inscription before the tomb and the church containing it were destroyed in the French Revolution. Sadly, too, his house in the market square of Condé no longer stands. The money from its sale a year after his death funded an annual procession in his memory, during which were sung, according to his own wishes, his twin motets Pater Noster and Ave Maria. The well-known head-and-shoulders likeness of Josquin wearing a turban is a woodcut made in 1569 and eventually published in 1611 by Petrus Oppmeyer, who declared it was based on an oil portrait possibly dating from the composer's lifetime. That portrait had been bequeathed in 1568 by one Petrus Jacobi to St. Gudul's Church, now Brussels Cathedral. It was there that Oppmeyer made his fortunate copy before the original was destroyed by Protestant Confederates in 1579. Intriguingly, the only known likeness of our other quincentennial composer, Robert Fairfax, is also a chance survival and may well too be authentic. It is a sketch, dating from 1643, of a long-lost memorial brass, once affixed to Fairfax's tomb at St Albans Abbey, now the cathedral of that name in Hertfordshire. The nature of Fairfax's role at the Abbey remains uncertain, but his mass and motet in honour of St Alban can hardly have been composed for any other church. The inscription reads, Pray for the souls of Master Robert Fairfax, Doctor of Music, and Agnes his wife, the which Robert deceased the 24th day of October, the year of our Lord God, 1521, on whose souls Jesu have mercy. Amen. 
exceptionally for this period, the exact date of Fairfax's birth into a well-to-do Northamptonshire family is also known, the 23rd of April, 1464. His father, William, was a tenant first of the Dowager Duchess Margaret Beauchamp, who lived some three miles away in the fortified manor house of Maxie Castle, and subsequently of her daughter, Margaret Beaufort, who, as the mother of King Henry VII, wielded considerable influence during her son's reign. If we wish to view Fairfax's rise to musical stardom as the result of powerful patronage, then we need look no further than this close connection with the English royal family. The young Fairfax may well have received his education in one or more of three richly endowed church choirs lying within 30 miles of his birthplace. Though their associated collegiate buildings have long since disappeared, these magnificent churches still standing at Fotheringhay, Hyam Ferrers and Tattershall testify to the opulence of English religion in the generations leading up to the seismic shifts of the Reformation. The upper classes who poured their personal wealth into church architecture were equally generous when it came to providing for church music. As the Dutch theologian Desiderius Erasmus would complain, they have so much of it in England that the monks attend to nothing else. To them, it constitutes the whole of religion. Such was the context of Fairfax's career. Of the details, however, we know nothing until the year 1497, when a document dated 6th of December discloses that the composer, now aged 34, was profiting from benefices in just the way Josquin was. It further discloses that he had been appointed a gentleman of the king's household chapel, a coveted position with life tenure. Apparently the appointment had been recent, for a list of the 15 gentlemen drawn up in 1500 still places him 13th in order of seniority. In subsequent lists, his name gradually rises, making a sudden advance to first place in a list drawn up for the coronation of Henry VIII in June 1509. Fairfax had reached the top of his profession. Fairfax took his first university degree at Cambridge when he proposed to the masters that ten years' study of speculative and practical music be sufficient to be admitted as bachelor in that subject. Nor were there any formal requirements for the doctoral degree, the authorities simply stating that it is allowed to master Fairfax, erudite in music, that beyond the level of bachelor his erudition may stand in place of the procedure to become doctor of music. Perhaps the ease of obtaining these Cambridge degrees prompted him to take a doctorate also at Oxford, where there was strict enforcement of the requirement to submit an exercise in musical composition, usually a mass. He duly submitted the Mass O Quam Glorifica, which in this sumptuous Lambeth Palace manuscript bears the annotation Dr. Fairfax for his form in proceeding to be doctor. The Mass is scored for five voices, here laid out separately in a double page spread known as choir book format. Following the priest's intonation of Gloria in Excelsis Deo, the two voices with decorative capital E's commence a duet on the words Et in terra pax omnibus bone voluntatis. The three voices with capital L's then take over in a trio beginning with the words Laudamus te. Not until the words Gratias agimus tibi do all five voices sing together.
This method of choral orchestration was the norm for English composers of the period. Yet it was presumably to impress the Oxford masters that Fairfax contrived this mass's five voice passages so that their combined time value is precisely equal to that of all the two and three voice passages added together. This is in fact one of the more straightforward of the mass's numerical aspects, another being that the combined time value of the first two five-voice passages of the Gloria is exactly two-thirds of the time value of the third and final such passage. Fairfax may even have colour-coded these aspects into an arcane form of notation appropriate to a doctoral degree but illegible for singing purposes, and of which the choir-book notation represents a practical simplification. This mass setting is one of six which survive by Fairfax. His other extant compositions consist of two magnificats, ten motets, eight secular songs and three contrapuntal exercises without words. Though he is known to have produced up to a dozen further works which are now wholly lost, the maximum total of around 40 compositions seems slight in comparison with such later composers as Palestrina, Bird and especially Lassus, each of whose work lists runs to many hundreds of items. Perhaps Fairfax can be excused on the grounds that compositions as intricately proportioned as the Mass O Quam Glorifica required many hours of patient numeric calculations before any consideration could be given to the notes themselves. Perhaps, too, the same excuse should be extended to Fairfax's English contemporaries, in comparison with whom he emerges as the most prolific. To the question, how many pieces did Josquin compose, we can offer only the perplexing answer, about half of them. No fewer than 325 works are attributed to him in manuscripts and books from up to the year 1600. But only around 150 of these remain serious candidates for the Josquin canon. In the last 50 years, two compositions that had been ranked among his very finest, the motet Absalom Philime and the mass Da Pacem, have been conclusively revealed as the work of other composers. Of the 18 mass settings still on the Grove work list, Josquin's authorship of five either has been or remains controversial. This is not just a serious problem for modern perceptions. It was already a serious problem in the 16th century. We have it on the authority of Zarlino, that sometime between 15 and 15, 1515 and 1520, his friend and colleague, the composer Adrian Villat, was present at a performance in the Sistine Chapel of a six-voice motet, Verbum Bonum, which the papal singers believed was by Josquin. So dismayed were the singers when Villat identified himself as the composer that they never sang the motet again. Nor was Josquin's authority taken any less seriously by the Renaissance aristocracy. 
In his celebrated Book of the Courtier of 1528, Balasar Castiglione quipped that whenever a motet was sung at court, it pleased no one and was considered worthless until it became known that it had been composed by Josquin Desprez. No wonder then that, as the 16th century wore on, compositions kept appearing under Josquin's name that are nowhere to be found in the manuscripts and prints dating from his lifetime. In 1540, the Nuremberg music publisher Georg Furster wrote, in the preface to an anthology of motets, I recall a certain eminent man's saying that now Josquin is dead, he is producing more compositions than when he was still alive. Josquin's reputation benefited hugely from continental print culture. Ottaviano Petrucci, for example, who in 1501 established himself as the first commercially viable printer of polyphonic music, honoured nine composers with a volume each of their mass settings, but honoured Josquin with no fewer than three such volumes. There was to be no such luck, however, for Fairfax and his English colleagues. Before Bird's songbooks burst on the London market in the late 1580s, the only secular music known to have been printed in England was an anthology of 20 songs issued in 1530. Though all that survives of this publication is a single copy of the base part book, this is enough to show that Fairfax's name was attached to two items. Still, despite this meagre representation in print, English music manuscripts dating from as late as a hundred years after Fairfax's death show that collectors and copyists continued to take an interest in his music long after that of his contemporaries had been forgotten. How then do these two composers fit into the evolution of European music as we understand it today? Both are connected to the earlier past through their use of Cantus firmus technique, already a centuries-old method by 1500. This involved first laying out a borrowed melody in long notes in the tenor part, and then treating the resulting Cantus firmus, or fixed song, as a kind of spine around which the other voice parts could be worked out bit by bit. In this extract from the Mass Oquam Glorifica, we see Fairfax still very much wedded to this venerable technique. Both composers, too, are connected to the more recent musical past through their experimentation with the nascent technique of fugue. But it has to be admitted that in this respect, Josquin was immeasurably the more prescient. Most notably in his Missa Pange Lingua, almost certainly the last of his masses and dating probably from around 1510, he took the unprecedented step of dividing his cantus firmus into short segments, disposing these among the four voices at intervals of fifths and octaves.
Without this technique, later 16th century music as we know it would simply not exist. And Johann Sebastian Bach would now be famous for other kinds of music, if indeed he were famous for any music at all. Though fugue would eventually recede from the foreground of musical forms, it continued to be regarded with great seriousness by the vast majority of composers from Haydn and Mozart to Bartok and Shostakovich. Over the last five centuries, compositions and student exercises opening in the manner of Josquin's Kyrie must have mounted up to a number beyond reasonable estimation. Josquin's use of fugue has less to do with seeing into the musical future than with his influence, particularly via the printed page, on a vibrant 16th century musical present. For Fairfax, England offered no such opportunity. Yet this remains perhaps the only really significant difference between two composers whose lives and careers were remarkably similar. Both were born in villages. Both were trained in music as boy choristers. Both enjoyed the patronage of kings. Both knew what it was to be the most highly regarded composer in whatever circles they moved. And 500 years posthumously, both are commemorated this year.